joking. <laughs> Um, hola, comadres. Welcome to the sixth episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. We have an awesome guest today, uh, my friend Edmund, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Who are you? Uh, my name is Edmund Francis. I wear many hats. Um, currently, I'm a therapist at a private clinic. Most recently, I was a residential uh, clinical supervisor at a substance abuse facility, but I have various different experience in group homes, uh, family therapy, um, uh, OMWDD programs, various different things. So I've been around the block. Amazing. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get into the topic. Uh, today's topic is people first language and counseling uh, for children with special needs. Um, so one of the reasons the topic came up as a teacher, I tend to advocate for my students, um, you know, with parents to get them counseling because they experience things in a different way. And a lot of the time the parents do not, especially some parents, usually children of color, um, feel like uh, there's like all these taboos and like, you know, caveats to having your children attend therapy. Um, so I feel like because it's, mental health month for men this month right in november i mm -hmm. feel like it's a good topic to cover and um we need to be i want to promote creating inclusive environments um for our children so that's the reasoning okay. behind that awesome awesome i think that's very important and i appreciate all the hard work that you do thank you Edmund. So you said that you're working. So what are you doing right now? Like you're a counselor, you're working, you're not so, doing the uh, substance clinical abuse, supervision. No, yeah. no uh, I'm not a clinical supervisor. That was too much. But um, I'm working uh, at my, uh, I'm a partner at a private practice. So I've been doing that for like five years, working with various different um, groups. But I guess my age specialty is probably five to a uh, young adult. So that includes teens and things like that. But then um, depending on people's cognitive function, it could be on any uh, uh, age spectrum. That's important to know also, like mm -hmm. a lot of people, um, you know, I've, I'll tell them my child's age, but uh, chrono chronologically he's his age, right? Mm -hmm. But developmentally there's a different mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about, can, you know what, this was not part of the questions that I sent you. No worries, but can we, freestyle. Yeah, can we talk about um, how does, how, how is that calculated, like developmental age? Um, so when I was working at the group home, uh, it we have this thing called, you probably, I know you're familiar, ADLs and things like that, things they can do for themselves. Um, so based off what they, how, what level of function they could do independent that what we base a lot of things off age or, or, or uh, language or uh, being able to communicate. Um, so I think that was a big part of it. And I think part of it, it's not a hard term, but I think it gives us some idea, um, you know, either a mental health provider or some sort of uh, person in that person's company to know how to kind of handle that. Um, so I could see how it could be kind of, you know, um, like a put down, you know, um, someone's, you know, uh, you know, 47 and you're calling them two, you know, um, you know, that, that could be, um, but it's not a, a it's just a general um, framework, but it's, I don't think it's something we should hold someone to. And also you shouldn't use that to, um, you know, treat them any different. Or I think if someone's 47, you're not going, you have to respect them, you know, as, as someone older. All right, ready? Okay. Action. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to get back into it. Um, what made you decide to pursue that career? Uh, so I've, I grew up with very uh, community-oriented uh, grandparents and uh, um, active community-oriented mom. My grandparents were activists. Um, 
So I think some part of me always knew that it was important to help people, however you, you can. Um, but in college, I started off as a physical therapy major and I realized where really was the social impact? You know, I mean, medical, you know, is important, but I think it's important to, you know, once you cure the body, then what, you know, and then even with physical therapy, uh, a lot of these injuries are, you know, you know can be mentally traumatic or you know, can be caused by a car accident, all these other things. And after you, you know, deal with the body, then what? So then I decided to switch to health sciences, um, having some um, desire for um, like working with substance abuse. Because I think even though I didn't know that directly uh, in high school or my community, I saw the impact that it had. Um, so then working with kids and things like that in grad school, um, I was just looking for a part-time job, something that was flexible and things like that, and end up um, working in a group home. Just, you know, they can say I can create my own hours, you know, uh, I guess the made shift thing. And I really, really loved it. It became a really um, inspiring job, the type of probably the first job in my life where I didn't feel like I'm working. You know, I would go to work, you know, pick kids up from school, you know, or go to the movies or, you know, make dinner, you know, and it just seemed like you are a part of their family. So I think that was really, and I think that's where I got connected with uh, the um, special needs uh, population. So. I love that. Um, all right, Edmund. So there is, I feel like there's a lot of controversy regarding mm -hmm. how we refer to people with special needs. Mm-hmm. And um, during my studies and while I was training to become a special education teacher, um, we were taught about people first language. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted you to like touch on that and like, let's talk about that and like, what is the importance of that? Mm -hmm. um, why, what is the reasoning behind it? Because a lot of people want to say that it's, um, we're just like millennials and we're very sensitive and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But um, there's a reasoning behind people yeah. first language. Yeah. Um, I think first language is important. Like, I think things are complicated in general in terms of language. Um, I was thinking even when you were talking, even how we describe people uh, on the spectrum, you know, that completely changed in the past couple of years. Um, uh, you know, we use people with special needs, but, you know, maybe five, six years ago, disabled was, you know, a common thing. So I think it, it changes. And then when you, uh, and this is my observation, you can correct me, but even when it goes from a language barrier or language uh, difference, um, I think things are behind, you know? So um, I think, you know, in Spanish cultures or uh, Latinx cultures, crazy is, you know, disused, you know, uh, disabled, broken, those types of uh, language, you know, um, even though it might not be used as offensively, it's still kind of used. Um, so I think those, unfortunately, it hasn't been really updated in uh, culturally as of yet, you know. Um, and I think the idea of uh, culturally changing language, you know, might feel oppressive, you know to uh, their staff, oh, you're changing. I've been calling my kid a retard, you know, for, for years, you know, I'm just using this example, but you know, that's that's their word, late name for it. But then oppressively, you know, the American doctor, you know, oh, you can't use that language, et cetera, you know? Um, uh, can I interrupt you? Uh, of so course, I, I said like that for emphasis. When, no, yeah, I was like, I cringe when, when like people, who are not watching the video, my ba like I literally my whole body like tensed up when mm -hmm. I heard the word. Mm -hmm. um, it was a word that we grew up saying, remember? Mm -hmm. Like we yeah. were like we're around the same age mm -hmm. and we grew up saying that word, um, and it was used as an insult to another person. So mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you with regards to Latinx cultures and uh the use of people first language. I feel like mm -hmm unless you're like in the field and you work mm -hmm. with people that have special needs, um, it's very difficult for people to understand why mm -hmm. you're using And it was a medical kind of term at, at some point, like 50 years ago, you know? Um, yeah. 
what's the, do you mind if I ask you a sensitive question? So sure. when you uh, speak or when you speak to uh, other parents who have uh, special needs kids, what type of language do they use? You know, I'm curious. I don't know the... the uh, I uh, end up correcting, like in Spanish at least, um, uh, when they're saying like, oh, my kid, uh, un niño autista, right? Like an mm -hmm. autistic child, right? Okay. And I kind of tell them, I'm like, mm, un niño con autismo. Because mm -hmm. it's like you have to separate. Mm -hmm. That disability or the diagnosis isn't mm -hmm. all there is to that child. Mm -hmm. So I emphasize the fact that it's important to, you know, look at the child first and mm -hmm. then this is like an extra thing it's mm -hmm. kind of like when you go to the mm -hmm. pizza shop and they give you like an mm -hmm. extra slice of pizza or something like that mm -hmm. it's not it's mm -hmm. not all they are as a person okay so do you think culturally at least in the latinx community they're catching up with more so the language or uh, unless you're like actively doing it like uh, mm -hmm. even 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 when somebody's not acting quote unquote uh properly mm -hmm. or um uh, for their age they they go and say like that kid's crazy yeah so yeah, it's yeah. like you know using like kind of talking to people and like educating them that's mm -hmm. been a lot of my uh job mm -hmm. especially when um coming around like i travel back to my country all the time um so you know talking to people and um educating them is important okay. good i'm glad there's there's in that direction you know So wait, we, we didn't get into the definition. What is people first language? I mean, you're the expert on, you know. No, not. You want you from are. my, per you want from like. Yeah, from your perspective. Yes. Um, so a lot of it, I think it's just, you know, it stems from a lot of different things in terms of like, I think how people want to uh, be spoken to, how they want to identify themselves. Um, so I think it's important. I think as in a culture that we're living in, uh, allowing people to um, kind of navigate language for themselves. And then also I think in terms of communication, you know, um, really similar to what you said, eliminating those, you know, those major diagnosis and just people, you know, this is Ethan, this is, you know, John, this is Emily, you know, and these are characteristics about the person rather than this is this person or this person has angels, whatever they are, you know, we're, you know, putting all that, putting characteristics of that person, but not necessarily diagnosis. But of course, medically, you know, um, that's, that's, uh, um, they don't see it that way and that, that won't be at the forefront, unfortunately. So um, I wanted to talk about self-esteem wise, like how does that affect people when you change just like one thing that you, like how you refer to them instead mm -hmm. of saying uh, Aiden, the the autistic boy, Aiden, mm -hmm. um, Aiden, the child, the, the kid with autism, mm -hmm. you know, I, or whatever, instead mm -hmm. of referring, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how does that affect them? emotionally because you you deal with that aspect of it mm -hmm. and i think it's it's to go to answer your question and then go back to a little bit i think things have completely changed because i think um before we thought a this person is autistic and that's it you know every other symptomology is related to that you know but that's not might not be the case person might be anxious person might be you know have ptsd might be you know you know have um you know, Eridobot, you know, all these things are not, you know, related to the autism, you know? Uh, and I think in the past they thought, oh, these are everything that comes with it, you know? So if you're depressed, oh, that's just that, you know? So I think part of it's really, really healthy to, um, it does change self-esteem, but also the accuracy of the, the person, because it's, you can't just group everything based off that. And I think it shows that there's diversity in, these diagnoses. And I think that's why I think um, now, even with autism, it's a spectrum, you know, so it could mean any sort of thing. And then um, 
who's Asperger's, it's completely different. And then there, there could be a change from, you know, before you could, you couldn't go, you could, um, at least what I remember is, you know, uh, you, you went up, but you couldn't go back down, you know? So once you have Asperger's, then everything kind of wipes away, you know? Um, but I think now with the, the, and then if you met a certain requirement, you know, um, if you, you know, were good at all your grades, you know, then it would be like Asperger's, you know? Um, but let's say if you're good at math, you know, they, you know, or certain things, then they were like, oh, no, you're autistic, you know, just be, you had to be this child prodigy, which is weird, you know? So I think now I think it, it's because of everything, it ebbs and flows, which I think is healthy. So I think part of it working with kids, you know, on the spectrum is to help them identify themselves and, and them to figure out ways to best uh, function for themselves, you know, build, build them tools to be able to uh, thrive, you know, and really heighten the, themselves um, for their strength. And I think a lot of people, the thing I think is fascinating um, for people that I've seen on the spectrum is the things that are heightened in are, are huge, you know, it's, I, I, I joke that it's like a, it's a mutant power, you know, each of them have a different one, you know, so that, I find that really fascinating and intriguing. I love that. Um, so Aiden's mutant power <laughs> is that he's really, like, he's hyperlexic. He can read mm -hmm. college level text. Um, mm -hmm. And then he can remember stories mm -hmm. verbatim mm -hmm. and he'll do the voices and everything and like his new thing is now that he dubs he'll put an episode of a cartoon and then find audio that matches mm -hmm. so he'll re-record re a new video with a dubbed audio See? Does that make sense? Yes. I, 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 and I nobody might... taught him audio editing and it, and like <laughs> most of the things, the thing, the audio he picks always makes sense. Like mm -hmm. when you look at the video, it completely makes sense to what mm -hmm. he's recording, which is amazing. I'm just like, yeah. who taught you this? I, and, like I'm it's learning. It's super skill and it's learning. And, and I think part of it, I think societal is how we can use those skills, you know, to build him a super successful promising career. And I don't think society really shapes things that way. I agree. Okay. That was amazing. Um, so how do you, what, what is your type of therapy? Like, how do you work with your clients? Do you do like talk therapy, play, or do you do um, other things? So when I first started working, I was contracted through ACS and we were doing family functional therapy, which uh, is a mix shift of CBT, DBT, a lot of other things. Um, I have some experience with, um, with um, motivational interviewing and things like that. When I worked in group home, um, it was more hands-on, you know, uh, you know, addressing feelings, things like that, just because I think a lot of times, you know, you can go to all these schooling and things like that. But what do you do if, you know, someone's um, cognitive or, or, or language, you know, is, is, um, is a difficult challenge for them or, or a language barrier, you know, you, you really can't, all the fancy metaphors, you know, the processing, you really have to throw that out the door. So I think it's really about, um, especially with younger kids, putting things in various tangible forms, you know, um, either stories, role-playing, uh, videos. I think with kids, you have to kind of hit them at all fronts. So if it's not, you know, it's also it's, it's uh, repeating things, uh, visuals, uh, games, you know, all these things to really um, kind of, stress you know what you want to teach them and one of some might stick some might not but i think the goal and whatever that is if they get hey you know um hitting is bad you know or they get it in some sense of what i'm using that for example or if they um you know 
when I'm mad, I'm going to breathe five times, you know? So however they get that from the video or pictures or things like that, though, some part of it will stick. Yeah. The, the, when I come up with behavior plans for the kids, it, it, it sounds silly to some people because they're like typically developing, but it actually works. So like, you know, teaching them, for example, my son, actually, we were having issues when he first transitioned into junior high school that um, he was getting a little um, aggressive um, mm -hmm. with the teach, not even the kids, the teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, and that could be medical, hormonal, all these things, you know? So that's that, the thing. That's, like, he's, like, mm -hmm. going through his body is mm -hmm. 13, right? Mm -hmm. But then the rest, he's developmentally, he's not there. Mm -hmm. But um, it was kind of like coming up with a plan for him like a little checklist every day. We say it in the morning. It's kind of like our little mantra. Like we keep our hands to our, and then he finishes it for me. Okay. So, and, and we, we need a break. We ask for one and mm -hmm. our phone goes in our backpack. We use our, our computer for schoolwork, mm -hmm. like all these things that like people won't like usually think about, like you have to like learn how to work with the child and like give them uh, options and tangible things that they're going to actually respond to. Cause the mm -hmm. thing is like, I don't know if you heard that one of the first episode we were talking about introducing religion to kids with special needs. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, I was conflicted about introducing religion to Aiden cause he is a very literal person. Yeah, so yeah, a yeah. lot of the nuances in the language and the things that you're teaching via religion, mm -hmm. um, kind of get lost mm -hmm. not lost necessarily but it's kind of like yeah how do you explain that to that child mm -hmm. and it's feelings and i think some things they get you know so like even the call and response you know i think that's really important and i think where does that come from it's come from you know um african ancestry roots you know culturally so i think in some ways i think the the blueprint in terms of that's the way that we teach various different people comes from you know our uh, spirituality or even church, you know, that feeling of, oh, everyone, you know, you can even say with, how did you know I was going to say such and such, you know, this is the feeling, you know, and then you can, he can expand on what that is, you know, is it, you know, God, is it whatever, is it, you know, intuition, whatever it is, you know, um, have him kind of get in tune with whatever those internal things that he might not be able to explain, you know, how do you like, for example, he, he probably, I know you're a loving parent, so he knows what love is, but is that something we can necessarily tangibly, you know, put our finger on, you know, no, but I think in some ways expand off things he does know and, you know, build up from there. Yeah. So I was talking about how, um, I'm just teaching him to be a good person, like for goodness yeah. sake, not because you have this fear that somebody's going to, you're going to burn perpetually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <In hell. laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. So what are, what, can you give me some like anecdotes from, obviously you're not going to use names, mm -hmm. um, situations that you've been in that you've had to like, kind of, cause I know you've worked, you worked in residential programs. Yes. Yeah. For a long time, so, manager, yeah, all these things, yeah, super. So, what what kind of situations w did you have to deal with in the in the center? Uh, you mean the most extreme, or or just like things that would come up that a lot? Kind of, yeah, things that would come up a lot. Because the thing is, like, a lot of parents. Okay, okay, wait, no. Before we get into that, um, mm -hmm. how do you work with kids that are nonverbal? Mm -hmm in your sessions so uh when i was sad i had the, a challenging couple cases um of selective mutism and that was very very uh difficult uh, but i think part of it i understand that with that particular case it was more so a family dynamic which was really really interesting because that person would only speak to their family, you know? Um, and then I think in some ways, you know, in the family, there was a primary vocal person and everyone else did it, you know? So I think part of it could be family dynamic, then other bit could be uh, uh, cognitive and mental um, 
but then I think in some ways that he he did very well in school, you know. Um, you know, he's on the autistic spectrum as well. Um, and he thrives. So because of that, um, in especially with uh, the virtual learning, he just chose not to interact because, you know, and teachers kind of enabled a lot of some of those things. He's doing well, so then he doesn't need to speak. And, and, and a lot of his teachers weren't aware that he, he did actually speak because, I mean, he he might say one word or things like that. Or I think um, he had um, one teacher that he did really well with, I think in like uh, elementary school and she really pushed him. She, you know, maybe I'm not for her tactics, you know, kind of old school, but she would, you know, uh, have him stand up and speak out loud, you know, and wait, mm. you know, wait for maybe five minutes, you know, until he said one word and then he would say two words or three words. And he got to a point where he eventually got to like a paragraph, you know, uh, wow, but then, that's amazing. but then, you know, the last, the two years after that, he went back to not being, you know, pushed, you know? So I think a lot of it, it's, it's, it's understanding the root behind different things. Um, and then understanding, um, uh, trying to work with them with what they can do. So what we did do when in things is, you know, we uh, played games and things like that. And there were even in Uno, like we played Uno, he did everything silent. And then, you know, um, this is kind of a, a jerk move um, on my part. But, you know, if he didn't say Uno, he had to pick up two cards. So eventually, <laughs> you know. <laughs> He, um, <laughs> he had to, he started saying, you know. Oh, I love that. Um, but, but the, the thing is, it's not, it's not that you're being a jerk. It's like yeah, you're trying to motivate the child to speak. I was talking mm -hmm. about that. Um, so somebody I dated, uh, we're friends and, um, he has a child that just recently got diagnosed, not with autism or anything, just kind of like you know, the, what they usually do for the Department of Education, which is speech and language. Everybody has speech mm -hmm. and language. Mm -hmm. But they don't give an actual diagnosis, which is, that's going to be a topic for another episode. But mm -hmm. what I was saying to him, I was talking about Aiden's first speech therapist. Not the first, first, but like in early intervention. His name was Vikas. Shout out to Vikas if you're listening to the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, he was doing a doctoral degree in speech pathology. And he would always like push Aiden to use his words. Cause the thing mm -hmm. is, if you think about it, if I can get a full meal mm -hmm. or if I can get my preferred toy with using a gesture, do you think I'm going to actually speak? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, not at all. I'm just going to be like shortcuts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. this is, he understood that, that, um, logic, how they thought, right? Like the, the children with special needs, like, mm -hmm. or human interaction in general. Cause I, it doesn't have to be somebody with special needs. Like mm -hmm. if I can get something done for me without using mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. much effort, I will do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, to, <laughs> for them to understand their limits. And I think that goes back to the self-esteem when they're able to see that I'm able to do this, or even if they can't speak, Oh, I'm going to be able to, you know, uh, write things down or communicate or, you know, even, um, they have the, before it was like a the board. IPad. No, but before I remember it was like a, it looked like a keyboard where it had different, you know, ah, um, yes, I remember. pictures and things like that. But now the iPad, you can create whole different sentences and, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of different things. Like Yeah. I love that. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're empowering these children, uh, I remember when I was still doing my master's, uh, I was working as an assistant teacher for the Department of Education. And, um, you know, I would go to certain schools and there were kids that were really aggressive, but it was because they couldn't find their voice. They didn't have a way to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. And that in turn kind of affected their behavior. Mm -hmm. Cause I like once, once you figure out how they can communicate, like if you're going to mm -hmm. use symbols or yeah. if you're going to use a PEC system or if you're going to use an iPad, 
once you figure out how they can communicate, it's mm -hmm. way easier. The behavior usually decreases. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that. I have. And then I think also to comment on the aggression, aggression is a form of communication, I think, especially with those on the spectrum. Uh, tactile things that I had a client that would, um, he had, you know, anger toward his mom. So I think in the group home, he would, uh, you know, go after a lot of the, the, the female staff. And I think part of it, you know, we would, um, you skip and things like that. And the thing that I think he, his desire was that he wanted, he would act out so that, um, en enough to the point where, he, um, they would have to put, you skip on him, but he would want, you know, um, the, uh, the woman's staff to hug him and things like that, you know, just, you know, to have some tactile thing from motherly figure. Um, mm. So a lot of times when he, when he was acting, um, and this is really interesting, but it worked eventually, uh, when he was acting aggressively and, um, we do skip, we'd make sure that's a male staff so that that wouldn't be a reward, you know, for that type of, you know, but then if he was, you know, uh, behaved and things like that, he could get maybe a hug or, you know, high five or, or something, you know, um, I think that kind of decreased some of those huge escalation, but I think it's understanding the root and what's the, the, the need of expression, you know, for that. So for people that don't know, what is skip? So it's a, um, it's various different, uh, touching techniques. Uh, it's changed, um, but some of it involves holds, uh, I would say mild restraints, you know, but everything has to be timed, you know, so, uh, but it's only used for, um, uh, physical when, you know, someone's either has a potential hurting themselves or are hurting someone else. Okay. Um, I don't know. Like, I feel like. You have so much knowledge. I just want you to kind of like talk a little bit more about other situations. Like you talked about one child, but like other mm -hmm. things that you've dealt with or mm -hmm. something that a kid wanted to communicate with you, but you know, like people weren't really mm -hmm. like listening to them. Yeah. And does that make can, sense? Yeah. Can I talk about like a systematic thing also? And as it yes. to that? Yes. So, uh, one thing that I was, um, visitor. The editing is going to be terrible. <laughs> no worries. All right, I saw it coming. Um, Sorry. So the one thing, this is a kind of a sad story. Um, so a lot of kids age out, you know? So when we spoke about age and things like that. Um, so I went to school in Binghamton, which is a... Um, in some ways it's progressive, but some of it's still kind of behind, you know, kind of country place. Um, the systems in there aren't really helpful toward, you know, people of color or those, there's not really advocates on for people uh, with, who are on, on spectrum or special needs. So I had a, uh, a client that he would become aggressive pretty often, you know, but again, he was a softy. I think a lot of times um, he was sad, depressed, um, you know, his family would, you know, say they're visiting him and, you know, won't, you know, uh, he would spend uh, holidays, you know, alone, you know, because um, his family, you know, kind of lived in a trailer park. They were, you know, uh, you know, most likely, you know, they had some substance use, drinking use. Um, so I think the reason they were, they weren't responsible parents. Um, so I think a lot of that, he, he was angry toward that. So a lot of times, um, one, I mean, and he was very high functioning, uh, academically, you know, had challenges. Um, but I remember in interacting with him, he would, um, he tried to like, he was in the kitchen. He was able to, part of the thing we would, hygiene and cooking and, you know, cause he was 18. Um, so trying to teach him, you know, and then he got, 
angry at something that happened at school. And then he like held, you know, held a knife, you know, whatever. And I mean, part of me de-escalated the situation. Um, but knowing him, you have to know who he is and his root and, you know, the extent of his behavior and nothing, um, no part of him is ever aggressive. You know, he's, I mean, he's, I think he was like six, four, maybe 340 pounds, but physically, you know, um, you know, maybe, but again, I didn't take him seriously. And, you know, I said, Oh, you want to go for a walk? Go for a blow out steam. I let him walk a mile on his own, you know, and he was fine. So the thing that I found out, I, even though I stopped working at the group home upstate, I try to keep tabs of a lot of the community, you know, people graduate. So he was in an independent, you know, home living on his own, doing okay for a while. Um, but I think he got caught like stealing. Um, I mean, normal, you know, uh, young adult, I think he was at 21 or so. Um, so he became aggressive with, you know, of course he was defensive and things like that. Cops were, you know, I think, he was yelling and the cops were aggressive back and he became, you know, uh, uh, I, according to them hostile. So they arrested him and, um, I think he got into some sort of pushing match. So he ended up, um, serving time, you know, without any, um, you know, mental health leniency or anything. So that, that broke my heart. And a lot of it, I think the system really has to understand, you know, where the client is and where he's coming from and the background. And, you know, is, they, they should have just done a simple, has there been a history of any violence? No. You know, his parents should have been there or they could have, you know, gotten um, history of the, you know, his experience in the group home or, you know, what was really bothering him. You know, they, I think they yeah. didn't do any sort of psych evaluation, you know, until they don't he do was, that. Like, yeah. So they just react because the, they see a, 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 a big person, a mm -hmm. person of color that is tall and, you he know. He wasn't a person a big... of color, but I mean, even, but you can only right. imagine how it would be, you know. I don't yeah. even want to, like. Yeah, yeah, that's a difference. <laughs> so, you know, you they see a big person. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, he looks uh, looks like an adult. Mm -hmm. And um, they just kind of hold them to a different standard, like instead of like thinking like, mm -hmm. and that, that that's not, not only just for kids with special needs, but people that are having psychiatric issues that mm -hmm. need to be handled. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm like, you're, you were saying that and I'm thinking back to, I don't know if you read the article, but there was a, a guidance counselor that kind of basically acted like a human shield between him and and his his client who was a person with autism mm -hmm. and basically basically sorry i'm like laughing out uh, basically like they like he avoided the child getting shot because mm -hmm. he was able to be there for them mm -hmm. but like how many people are like taken into custody Mm -hmm. And they they aren't giving that full yeah. psychological evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then the in level of independence, because someone the special needs, do they deserve to be not in an institution or not have the ability to be independent? No. So that's the thing. It's like, you know, they should be able to live fruitful lives, you know, have a hiccup like everyone else, you know, how many, you know, 20 year olds, you know, or 21 year olds got in trouble for stealing or drinking, whatever, you know, a lot, you know, but does it, that doesn't mean that they're, it's the end of the road, you know, so they should be able to make normal that. mistakes. Um, I don't know if you follow the El Salon Chronicles, which is like, I'm under their network. And, um, one of the girls that is on one of the women rather mm -hmm. that is on there, she is a counselor as well. And she was discussing how, how like all of that like goes down and, and she actually works with the police department. So when, when, when there's a situation, they call her in and that's basically her scene, right? Mm -hmm. She's the one that is sending people to do things or not do things and mm -hmm. all of that. And then once she can deescalate the situation, mm -hmm. then they go in. That's in the city. 
Yeah. I mean, so I, I think, don't know if it's in, you know what? I'm actually going to get back to you on that. I okay. don't, I don't know but if it's I, in the city. But I think a lot of it's resources. The city does have a lot of different things, but if you take a small town here or there, they don't have those resources. So all those things, you know, fall by it. Basically, I think the severity of, you know, people or uh, cases where there's up more incidents is because there has been no um, support, you know, throughout the year. So someone might not get, you know, uh, I had someone, he was 15, didn't know how to walk, to speak, you know, um, but his family lived in the middle of the country and, you know, he, um, he, had, he would eat his clothes, eat his, you know, anything he could. So they would put him in like a, a like a kind of a jumpsuit, you know, uh, he was a, again, really big, you know, I think he was like six or two forty, Um, and they basically created part of his room into a cage. You know, I think they were, when he was in the group room, he learned how to sit on the table, you know, kind of walk upright, you know, but again, by the time he was 15, you know, um, you know, he didn't know how to do those things. But I think speaking to the parents, they, they saw that he could be a harm to them or a harm to, so they try to do the best that they can, you know, um, you know, so I think in some ways it, you have to give people the tools, but if people don't have the tools, then, you know, they, they unintentionally didn't do inhumane action. Um, there was, man, um, in the Dominican Republic, like I'm from there, I can speak about that place. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you always watch like Prima Impacto, which is like sensational news and, um, mm -hmm. in the Spanish language, uh, channels and, um. I remember seeing the story of a woman who had special needs and her family basically like built a little like outhouse for her behind the house and they had her chained and that messed me up so much. I was, this was before I had a child mm -hmm. and I just like think about that kind of thing. And, and, and it's like, it reminds me of like the 18, 1800, 1900, like early 1900s yeah, yeah. where mm -hmm. they were doing that kind of thing, like bottomies and all this other crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's just, there has been a lot of progress, but I feel like it hasn't been enough. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. Resources and knowledge. And, you know, so I think luckily, you know, podcasts like yours, you know, you give people, you know, the skills are even, um, the direction to do better, you know, for themselves and their kids. So. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up the conversation. Um, as always, you know that I am recording with Riverside FM. Uh, follow me at Comadiando Pod on IG, and you can follow Edmund at, drop your handle. Uh, Midnight EMF3 or positive therapy at IG, but still wait, working wait, on can that. Can you spell the positive therapy one? Yeah. P-O-S-I therapy, P-H-E-R-A-P-H-Y. Amazing. I didn't know you had that. That's awesome. Yeah, still um, in the works. Good. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadre gram. Uh, you can email me at comadreando at esethenetwork.com or DM me on IG. Um, what else? Thank you for spending time with your com madre and compadre. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Don't hang up.